Well, good morning. Glad you're back with me. I'm in the auditorium again today. And uh, as you can see, the first step in the door is a doozy. So uh, you probably don't want to walk in here unless you just absolutely have to, except that we're going to try to take a picture in here this morning after worship service this morning, just because we're getting ready for our contractor to begin work in here to um, put a floor back in. I'm pretty excited about that. We're going to look at the third chapter of Nehemiah this morning, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I don't don't worry, it's 30-some verses, and, and I... Uh, I do want you to read it sometime so that you can kind of get a grasp upon about what was happening. The uh, Nehemiah in chapter two had gathered together a building committee to lay the groundwork for the reconstruction of the wall. And he motivated a group of, of leaders. And those people caught the vision that Nehemiah had like, like a virus. I mean, it just spread throughout the community in, in a very rapid kind of fashion. And, and then as we arrive in chapter three of Nehemiah, the work begins. And the narrative is, is uh, really intriguing. You have to kind of dig into it a little bit to see why I say those kinds of things, but um, it is, it's a record of the people that were involved. And it's not everyone that was involved. There are, I think, about 38 individuals who are named, and we know there was far more than 38. I think there's 42 groups of people that are identified. And and so we, we know that there are far more people than 38, but it gives us a great representation of, of how God put the people together and how God organized the work and that uh, fulfilled the vision that Nehemiah had. And so we find the description of the work, who's responsible, and the kinds of work they were doing. I want to tell you, it was quite remarkable. Jerusalem was the pride of God's people. And I, in my opinion, that may, that may work against them from time to time. But David wrote in Psalm 48, these two verses, Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise in the city of our God, his holy mountain. It is beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth. Like the utmost heights of Zaphon is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. Those words that David wrote about Jerusalem were, I think, the, the uh, example of how people felt about the city. It was very important to them. It was very important uh, for them to understand that this was God's city. And so it's, in my opinion, throughout history, there were times where the place became more important than the God of the place, and, and that's generally when things unraveled. And so this morning, I think what I want us to do, and this is going to be a little different sermon than the way I normally preach because I'm not going to use the verses of the chapter specifically, or not all of them anyway. Um, but I do want us to examine the work. I want us to see why the people were doing what they were doing. And so let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, I thank you for an opportunity to examine your word, to learn truths about who you are and what you desire from us. And God, I pray that as we uh, embark on the building part of this, this plan, that we'll remember that what we're here to do is to honor you and not ourselves. Father, I pray that the, the folks that will be working in here will be safe. I pray that those of us that will be supporting them will be ready. And God, I pray that this morning we hear a word from you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Leadership sets the example. In chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place. Building as far as the Tower of Hundred where they dedicated and as far as the Tower of Haniel. Let me reiterate who this is. Eliashib is the high priest. Now, it is remarkable to me that the high priest became involved in this work the way that he became involved in this work. 
even these guys, even this guy's hands were consecrated into the Lord. And so there were, it was not the type of person that you would find doing manual labor, especially the kind of manual labor that it took to rebuild a wall. And, and so they were not one that would be given to that. They had a spiritual purpose in the community, and primarily that was their task, to be the spiritual guide for the nation. And he was appointed by God for a very specific leadership role among his people, and nothing about this guy screams gate builder or wall builder or, or anything like that. And yet we find this high priest and his fellow priests joining together and conducting part of the manual labor um, that everyone else is going to be involved in. And so they rebuilt the gates. There's, there's a lot of, there's a, a lot of uh, extraneous issues. I don't want maybe extraneous in the right kind of word, peripheral issues when you read through this passage about the direction that they worked around, the, the which, which gates came first and, and the order. And I, and I think you could read a lot into the passage if you wanted to right there, but the reality is that there was, there was a plan. And the plan was to rebuild this wall. And so everybody became involved in it. Nehemiah was given the original vision and he passed it on to the people of Israel and then the leadership of Israel became involved in this. One would expect people of priestly fashion to pick up the vision and then to preach it and motivate and enlist, maybe even oversee the work. But, but these guys jumped in with both feet. They went to work. I think the lesson for us here in leadership is very simple. Set the example. Ministry is hard, messy work. Sometimes it's straight up hard physical labor and people respond to leaders who are not afraid to set the example. You know, there's been some really impressive work done in this place right here by leaders in our local church. They got in here and they got their hands dirty and their, everything about them dirty. I got to tell you, this was not the cleanest tear out you've ever seen in, in, uh, and they worked really hard. I watched them sweat, um, joined them in sweating some. And I will tell you that the work that was done here by the leaders in our church, I think absolutely sets the example. They gave up what little free time they had to begin the work of restoration in this structure. And none of them have done it for any recognition or any honor. None of them want their names posted anywhere or said that, they were the ones that cleaned this mess out. In fact, the only reason that they've engaged in this process at all is to do the one thing that we should do, and that's to honor God. And so that brings us to my second point in this. There's a common goal. Now, you might read through that narrative in chapter 3 and, um, and surmise that the goal was to complete a restoration project. You might look at it and say, oh yeah, they're absolutely, I mean, they're, they're on target, they're on fire, they're going to get this goal accomplished and they're going to rebuild the wall. But, you know, that's really not what the, the goal was. The word built is used six times in the passage and it literally means rebuilt. There was no new material involved in the wall building, just the gates. That, that had been burned with fire, and so that material was gone. The rest of the material that they built with or rebuilt with was already there. It was lying in ruins. It was on the ground, much of it. It was, it was rubble instead of a wall. And so they were taking what God had previously provided to them and rebuilding it, making it into something new. A reassembly, maybe, is a way to look at it. And the real goal of the project wasn't to rebuild. It was to bring glory to God. I struggle to emphasize enough the importance of this truth. We need to recognize that um, it's not about the wall. And this isn't about a floor. Churches today build in a variety of ways. It's not just structures and parking lots. Some, you know, some of their structures are super opulent and others are very meager. And we, we look at that and say, oh, wow, look at what they've built. And some of the things that churches do are just programmatic. You know, we're just starting something new, creating something um, that, that, you know, we think is going to work. But I think that what God actually calls us to is rebuild, renew. 
It's kind of like that time that in your life, if you're a Christian, that you realize that there was there was something wrong with your relationship. It wasn't where it should be. And and so by recognizing that, God led you down a path toward restoration or, or renewal or rebuilding even. And so as churches rebuild, it's not always about physical stone and dirt and concrete. And a lot of times it's about that inward condition of our heart that just needs a refreshing and a renewal. For others that don't know Christ as their Savior, the, the, it is an actual building process. Receiving Christ as your personal Savior and Lord sets up the temple in which God resides. This Holy Spirit comes and indwells inside of us and lives inside of us. And so we have this, this temple. And so I would tell you that if you haven't been built, you need to be built. And if you've been built, maybe it's time to be rebuilt. Maybe it's time to renew that relationship. Now, you're not going to lose your salvation ever once you accept Christ. It's a permanent fixture. But from time to time, we need that relationship renewed, maybe rebuilt just a little bit. If we're proud of ourselves, then we're done. We've missed the whole point altogether. This has to be about bringing honor and glory to God. Whether that's in us personally or in some kind of project that we're working on, he is the one that will move in the hearts of people to invest the resources that are necessary to, to bring people to salvation, to introduce people to Jesus, to pour concrete on a slab in a building. All of those resources come from God, and it's not something that we can do on our own, I promise you. There's no one in our midst or in any way involved that deserves any glory out of a rebuilding project. Just God alone. And so I want to submit to you this morning that we remember that God alone be glorified in our work. Paul said to the Corinthians in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And yes, I know he was giving instructions about the Lord's Supper. And I know the context. But I think there's an application here for everything that we do, that whatever we do, we do it for the glory of God. I think that's an important truth in the life of the Christian. We have a common goal. Glorify God in everything that we do. And so we find an example in our leadership. We strive for this common goal of glorifying God. And then we find ourselves stretched to the limit. Everyone played a part in rebuilding the wall. From the highest nobles to the to the normalest of normal people. I don't even know if that's a word, but I used it. Everyone was the same. Everyone grabbed rocks. Everyone rolled rubble. Everyone worked on gates. Everyone did everything. And so we have to keep in mind that this group of people rebuilt over two miles of wall. Some of it are 40 feet high and 20 feet wide. I want you to know that that is a really significant project. If you've ever driven up I-35 from, from Davis to Oklahoma City, you know that ODOT can't even do that because these people did it in 52 days. <laughs> Can you imagine? 52 days. I suspect some of these people didn't like each other. They might have even yelled at each other because their dog pooped in their yard or something. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you that they all worked together toward this common goal, which was to glorify God. Every single person in the community took part, even some folks from around the community that weren't even Jewish, that weren't part of the children of Israel. They took part in this rebuilding project because they saw it. They saw the vision, they saw the need, and they jumped in. No one was excluded from the task that would ultimately bring glory to God. Now, those of you that know me know well that I would never... I don't. Asking you for money is not my thing. It's not what I do or even ask. God is good enough at doing that for both of us. And so I trust God to make the asks. I look at this project and I know that we're stretched to the limit. Even so, God is still providing for us. We have a contractor who has discounted his this project so deeply that I 
I, he's certainly not making any money. Maybe he's even losing some. And I don't know for sure, but in doing so, he will help us bring glory to God. We've been given materials that saved us thousands of dollars in this project by people outside of our community of faith. And they're just doing that because, you know, God is providing. And so they will help us bring glory to God. And then this week, we lost the air conditioning in our temporary space over there. And, and it's going to have to be completely replaced, according to the air conditioning guys. And so, quite frankly, the only source for the resources we need to do that is God. We are stretched to the limit. Perhaps he'll use us or others around us, but I know without a shadow of doubt that God's going to provide every resource we need to get this stuff completed. And it's not going to be so that we'll have glory, but so that he'll have glory. When we're finished, we will declare that there is no way we could accomplish all we've done without God and his provision. And so we bring glory to God. I love this church. I love God more. More often than not, God asks us to do more than we can or know how to do. He did that with these people that were building the wall. They were not gate builders. They were not wall builders. They were just people that God enlisted in a task that would bring glory to him. God wants to show everyone around us who he is. And I believe that that's what's going to happen as we move back into this space in the very near future. It might not be 52 days, but it'll be pretty darn close. God wants to show us who he is. He wants to show everyone around us. And so when we're done, we know that God is responsible for the completion not us. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who loves us that much? A God that loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. A God that gave up his, his place in heaven to become man and walk on this earth so that he could experience the temptations we experience and live a completely sinless life so that he could be a perfect sacrifice on a cross just for us. Aren't you glad we serve that God? First and foremost, God wants you in relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And that is the primary thing. And once you enter into that relationship, I, I want you to know that he's going to call you to task. There will be things that he's going to ask you to do that you would have never done before. And when you do, you'll find what it's like to live in that relationship and to enjoy that relationship. God will absolutely see us through this project. And when we're done, we're going to give him all the glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the provisions that you have already given us. And we look forward to those that you will, you will move in the hearts of, of your people to give again. And Father, I know that we look at this and we recognize that we don't have all the resources we need to accomplish everything we need to accomplish. But I know that you do. I know that you have limitless, endless resources. And so, God, we ask that you would continue to provide and that you would help us recognize that it's not us that's providing them, it's you. Father, I pray that when we get to the day of completion and we set those final things in place, and we rededicate this place to you and your kingdom, that all of the glory, all of the honor for the completion will go to you. Then we will look at this task and say, this is something that only God can do. And he did it through us, with, for us, so that we might bring glory to a risen Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me. Hopefully the next time I'm sitting in here, it won't look quite like this. That first step just is a little sketchy. All right. We'd love to see you in Darty. Even though we don't have any air conditioning, we're still meeting in there today. And uh, last night when I was over there, it was about 85 degrees. This morning, I haven't been in there yet. And so I don't know. It is Sunday morning, by the way, as I'm recording this. And we would love to see you in person. We would love for you to join us. If the heat is not something you can do, I get it. You don't need to... Come, I'm just glad you watched this. I would ask you to pray. Pray for the resources we need to complete this task, and let's watch how God does that, shall we? You have a great week, and we'll see you next time.